was, as I was thinking about what to share and I'm, I'm praying, and the Lord gave me something, a whole sermon on issues of parenting, how to raise a godly child. For your information, if you've been going into the internet, there is a series of lessons I've been sharing on raising a godly generation. But yesterday night when I've set everything and I've put everything in order and read, wait, waiting for today, as I went to sleep, the Lord told me, no, that was yours. The Lord gave me something totally new, something that I've never thought I could share. And this is the message that the Lord is having for us this morning. It is a caution. Don't lose your identity in Christ. Don't lose your identity in Christ. I will start with a story. A story is told about a man was found next to a, a certain shopping mall and this man had been beaten by thugs properly, stripped naked. Everything within him has been stolen. No ID card, nothing that can be placed on him to recognize who this person was. And he was rushed to the hospital. And while he was there and gaining health and the wounds are drying, the, the doctors and the nurses thought this person had really gone unconscious, cannot, cannot talk. But one week went into two weeks, two weeks went into one month, no speech is coming. But when he was able to start talking, he was asked question, exactly who are you? Where do you come from? What really happened? And they discovered that this man was put into a condition of amnesia, something that kind of erased every memory in his mind. He could not remember even his name. He could not remember even where he came from. And you know, I'm thinking about such a tragedy that the enemy sometimes comes and he hits so hard. And when he hits so hard, he leaves you at a point when you forgot who you are. And for a Christian, the worst place in life is when you have lost your identity. You don't know who you are. And this is what the Lord is bringing us this morning. You know what? The book of Genesis chapter 1 verses 27 uh, Genesis 1.27, the Bible says, so God created human beings in his own image, and in the image of God he created them, male and female he created them. You know, I don't know what you think when you think about the people that God created. God created it in his own image. I've been thinking, what does an image of God look like? The image of God is full of love. The image of God is full of right attitude. The image of God is full of compassion. The image of God is just a perfect thing. Any character that is positive you can think of resembles the image of God. And so when God was creating us, he looked at us and he said, mm, this is beautiful. He himself, he did, what, he did a tick. What I created is very good. Not just good, but very, very good. That is in Genesis chapter 1, verses 31. And God saw all that he had made, and it was very good. And you know what? When you track back, you come to a point when Adam and Eve are in the Garden of Eden, and God is, uh, has given them specific areas of where to go, what to do. And when you read the book of Genesis chapter 3 and verse 1, the Bible says, 
Did God really say you must not eat from that tree in the garden? Let's, look, let's read from verse 1. Now, the serpent was more crafty than any of the wild animals the Lord God had made. He said to the woman, did God really say you must not eat from any tree in the garden? And friends, I'm here to remind us this morning, or this afternoon, sorry, that the enemy from generation to generation, from the time when the universe was created, he had an agenda of fighting God's purpose in our lives. He had an agenda of pulling down the image that God has placed in you. That very image that he said, I've created you in my own image. And you know what? Satan would want to create doubts in our minds. He would want to create things that will make us lose our focus on who we are in the eyes of God. And so I've been thinking about some of these things. Steps, I look, I look at them, steps that, uh, that moves on towards people losing their identity. And one of them is creating doubts in our lives. There are many times that the enemy will whisper words. He would whisper words of discouragement just to make you feel like, mm -mm, that's not what you, you are supposed to understand or know. The enemy is also going to contradict God's word. You see, if you read Genesis chapter 3 verses 4, let's give me Genesis 3 verse 4. The Bible says, verse 4, you will not certainly die. The serpent said to the woman, remember, God had warned the, 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 uh, Adam and Eve not to eat the, the tree in the middle. But then, here comes enemy who is trying to contradict God's word so that Adam and Eve would live a life of disobedience and in the process lose the purpose to why God has allowed them to be in that garden. And so Satan would like to, to take what God has made as, 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 as has said as perverted issue, confuse it, and then he destroys what good that God has created in us. The Bible says in John 10:10, 10, 10, the thief comes only to steal, kill, and destroy. That is the, have been the major agenda since time memorial. So, so when he comes to steal, he just does not only steal. He steals precious issues in our lives. When the enemy is targeting to remove you from the purposes of God, he begins by stealing your prayer life. He begins by stealing your love for God. He begins by stealing any attribute that is godly in you and now takes you to the next agenda. And then the next agenda is to kill. When he kills you, he makes sure that you lose your spiritual stand, your love for God and for the love for brethren is out, and he does not stop there. By the time he's, fini he's, he's finished with you and he's destroying you, people will only be seeing the aftermath of the killing and the stealing that has taken place. Those are the moments when you become an enemy of Christians. You just don't love anything called Christianity around you because the destruction element has begun in our lives. I pray that God forbid us. And these things happen when we lose our true identity of who we are as children of God. One other thing that the enemy does to make sure that you lose your identity is by fanning the spirit of pride in our lives. And you know what? It is pride that caused Lucifer, who was a praise and worship angel, kicked out of heaven. And when he landed on earth, he made sure that he's not going to, he's going to get back to God. And you know what? The enemy's agenda to get back to God or fight back to, uh, against God 
is to make sure that he has is hurting as many people as possible. He will cause division even in a church setup. He will cause confusion. He will cause many negative things that happen to our Christian walk for the purpose of getting back to God. And you know what? He lost the battle. Don't allow yourself to be an agent that the enemy would want to use to fight God. The beautiful thing is that when Christ is in you, you are more than a conqueror to fight the enemy. He lost it in heaven. But now he wants to fight God's purposes in your life. He is on a revenge mission against God, but using you. And the moment you allow yourself to be used of the enemy, that is the beginning of you losing your identity, knowing who you are, forgetting who you are as a child of God, and losing the purpose to why God wired you to be. Uh, one of the principles that the enemy used to get, uh, to get back to God is making sure that the caring idea, he knows that God cares. He knows that God's love. And so he's after the children of God who love God and who cares, he's after them to destroy their character. And that's one of the things that the enemy does in the process of causing us to lose our identity. He also wants us to live a compromised lifestyle. But you also need to know that uh, Satan knows that if he can work out to bring confusion in your life, he'll be able to cause you to come out of the correct direction or walking in tune and in line with God. And in that process, he will be saying, bravo, I have distracted him from focusing on God. And those are the moments when, as believers, we lose our true identity. May the Lord forbid that. He knows that if he can destroy what God intended to do in your life, he has, he has succeeded in hurting God by hurting the children, the children that God loves so dearly. You see, the enemy's opinion, he uses people's opinion and he would want to use the people, people's opinion against you. And when you start buying everything that people say about you, and sometimes some opinions which are said about you are so negative, and you buy that and you embrace it in your life, he's actually on the road to steal and kill and destroy you. Don't allow the enemy to divert who you are as a child of God. It is true. There are days when you are growing as a young person, maybe as a child in that family. Parents said so many things about you. Your peers could have mentioned so many things about you. And some are not very true. And some are so hurting. But one thing that comes out clearly about things which have been spoken about you is that they are trying to create another image that is not from God. They are trying to paint a different image about you that is negative so that you do not see your true identity of how Christ or how God looks at you. Many times I, I share with my family and I tell them, at this point, allow yourself to borrow specs. If you could borrow spectacles that God uses and you start looking at yourself using his specs or the eyes that God looks at you you will discover that God looks at you very differently. Because he's a God of second chances, he's a God of love, he's a God of compassion. He doesn't even remember, keep records of the things that you've done because he sees us differently. And that's why he created us in his own image. 
People around you may many times want to make you fit into what they want you to be and not what God wants you to be. And when you find yourself trapped in those opinions, there you are. You have started losing your identity as a child of God. Satan wants to use people to keep you from knowing your true identity. Sometimes he uses media. He uses media and culture. The things that sometimes comes from our television uh, programs, the soap operas, the kind of uh, some of the things that we keep on interacting with on a day-to-day -day basis, you realize that if you don't focus on getting to know your identity as a child of God, you'd want to be like what you are seeing on, the, on, on, on your TV. Or you'd want to be that kind of a person that you see in terms of how they dress or what, what they say or what they do or what they own. When you hear that uh, people talk about their wealth and you start imagining how can, can, how can I buy Kenya? How can I be among the people who, makes, uh, who, who are economically, economically strong and firm and standing for the land Kenya? And sometimes you may not know even how these riches were found. The worst part is to start fighting to be like them and forgetting what God wants you to be. And so, there are many things that can distract us. And my prayer is, don't allow yourself to be distracted. There are several patterns through that uh, there are, so, there are several patterns of thoughts that comes around our lives on a day-to-day -day basis. Amen? And uh, there, in, in those moments when you allow some reasons and some thoughts come through your mind, there are three, three schools of thoughts that automatically will come your way. One of the thought is the thoughts that God suggests and tells you to do. And then there are those thoughts which are suggested by the enemy. And then there are your own thoughts. Now listen, when God puts his thoughts in your mind, that's what we call inspiration. God's thoughts inspires you to do good and to make things right. But when Satan puts his thoughts in our mind, what is that? That's what we call temptation. Okay? But when you allow ourselves, when we allow our thoughts to override God's thoughts, and that's what I call stupidity, you lose it big time. When every time God speaks to you and tells you to do these things, you allow your, wisdom, your human wisdom to overrule God's idea or thought. And that is the beginning of our downfall as people of God. Allow me to share with you very briefly five important points of what makes, of how God looks us, look at us. What I mean is God's view on me in Christ Jesus or on you in Christ Jesus. And I'd want us to go to the book of uh, First Peter chapter 2, verses 9 to 10. Shall we be there? And this is what the Bible says. The Bible says, but you are a chosen generation. Uh, yeah, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, God's special possession, that you may declare the praise of him who has called you out of darkness into his wonderful light. Amen? Now, when you read that scripture, there are five things that we can talk about today that uh, brings God's view of who you are in Christ. 
the very things that also brings the true identity of who you are as a child of God. The Bible says you are chosen. Tell your neighbor you are chosen. You are a chosen generation. Amen. You are a royal priesthood. And you are a holy nation. You are God's people. And you are a treasured possession. I want to take some few more times to dwell on only on the first aspect. Because time cannot allow me to do all the five. And I'm thinking about being chosen. You know, being chosen or being a chosen generation actually means you can talk to yourself. I am completely acceptable to God. And he did that that particular day when he sent his son on the cross to die for me. That very moment when Christ said it is finished, I took their burden, I took their sins upon me. That particular day, you are acceptable before God. That is the particular day when he says, I have forgiven you. I have loved you with an everlasting love. You know, friends, in this world, you cannot avoid being hurt. People go through different wounds. And you know, one of the worst wound is the wound that comes out of rejection. I hear the story of this little girl who was brought into a home because by the time the mother was getting married, the, this lady was already born by the mother, but now is now living with a stepfather. And at one particular point, the siblings that he found there could not accept her. And so, there are wounds which can come out of our lives out of rejection. And it could be rejection from people who are so close to you, who you would expect the best out of them. Now, the spirit of re rejection can cause you to live a life that is not full of, uh, that, that is not well fulfilled. It's going to be a life that can make somebody live a, in bitterness. And these are things, rejection can be one major issue that causes somebody to lose their identity. You know what? When it comes to the issues of rejection, you need to know that the people who appear to reject you the way you are may not understand what God has put inside your life. The people may not even know the value that God has put you, the, the value that God attaches to you. They may never understood that. And so they have no idea what you are carrying within you. It's only God who knows it. My important point is don't allow yourself to throw a pity party on them. Don't even feel about it. Stay focused to know who are you in Christ. In the process of seeking for acceptance, there are times when people who have been rejected seek for, to be accepted in wrong places. That's why you hear a child who is grown up in this family uh, became, an, became pregnant while he's in school and then because of rejection, because the parents uh, maybe have not taken, have not really looked at her from the right angle of appreciating and loving and caring for her, even in that state, they present hard words on this little girl. And in the process, this girl seeks to be married very early before time. And wherever she goes, she's looking for acceptance. And sometimes she finds herself in the wrong hands to be accepted. In the book of 1 Peter chapter 
2 verses 9. I want you to look on this other side of, of, of the coin. Once you are not a people, but now you are the people of God. Once you had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. We are serving a merciful God. In that family, even when things get out of hand, it is important to learn, to appreciate, to look at people with the mercy. Even when they have at their weakest points and they don't look like they're amounting to something, that's the time when God wants you to throw a lot of love on them because our God is a God of mercy. So to be chosen is to present yourself to God and allow his mercy to take charge over your life. People like good things when you are chosen to represent an organization for a certain uh, event, it feels good. I also want to let you know that uh, acceptance is a gift. It is not a gift that is earned by good works or things that we present ourselves to be to please somebody for you to be accepted. Acceptance, especially the acceptance that comes from God, is a pure gift. God loves you with no condition. It is only humanity that we love with condition. I will love you because you can do this. I will love you because of this and that. But the God that we love, the God that we serve, is a God of no condition. His love is unconditional. He loves us in our weakest points. He wants to mend our lives so that we can uh, come closer to him. He loves us. He doesn't need our performance. The moments we start wanting to perform things so that we can be accepted, sometimes we lose it big time. The next point that I want to present is that uh, you need to know before God, you are extremely valuable. That is the acceptance part of it. You are extremely valuable. And you are priceless. God cannot put a tag of price on you. He just loves you the way you are. You are more than just acceptable. You are accepted in those moments, whether you are in the whether you are highs or you are in the lows. I want to finish by this scripture, Deuteronomy chapter 7, verses 6. What makes you valuable, can we read it first? For you are a people holy to the Lord your God. The Lord your God has chosen you out of the people on the face of the earth to be his people, his treasured possession. Tell your neighbor you are a treasured possession before God. That's what God looks at you and when he sees you, he sees somebody with no price he can attach to. And you know what? Today, if uh, who is the most famous person on, in Kenya? Uh, James Mwangi. James Mwangi Equity Bank, for example. If today he was selling a vehicle here, this vehicle belongs to James Mwangi, the CEO. And our brother, Pastor Mulua, is also selling his car here. And when somebody is given an opportunity to choose, Maybe looking at the, the opinion that he have on James Mwangi and Mulwa, he would think, ah, that car must have been taken care of so well. I'll go for James Mwangi's car. The question is, who possesses that particular item for me to buy it? But I want to bring it out clearly this way. When God looks at you, he sees your value is too high. Treasured possession. He owns you. And because you belong to God, you are more valuable than anything else that can be mentioned on planet Earth. That's how God looks at us. And this is my desire for us this morning. May we work towards appreciating who God is in our lives and love on him and live for him and stay focused to love him the rest of our life because that is the desire of God's heart that we may discover who we are in him and so that we don't lose our, our identity in him. Shall we pray together? Heavenly Father,
I bless your name this morning. I pray that even as this word comes out, O oh God, I pray that, King of Glory, there is somebody in our midst who needs you, who needs to understand that you love him. It doesn't matter what he's done or what he has gone through. You love him the way he or she is. I'm praying for that such a person this morning, oh God, may he find favor with you, to connect with you, Lord. And in that mood of prayer, if you're in this house this morning, and you're saying, Pastor, would you pray for me? I want this love of God upon my life. I want to have a true identity of me, and it begins by the love of God working in my life. Child of God, the Bible says you are totally forgiven. There is no condemnation in you. He loves you the way you are. You can raise that hand or you can see one of our pastors after this. You give your life to Christ. We'll be more than willing to pray with you. And Father, I pray for that soul and that person who has been struggling with issues in their life. That may they find your abundant love in them. May they find you of whom to find his life eternal. For this we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. The Lord bless you.